Hey guys, welcome to this week's um, Daniel Company training. I have lots of thoughts on the election and I will be discussing some of that tomorrow on our urgent education. Um, so stay tuned. I don't want to get into that right now. So let's, because if you get me started, I may not be able to stop and we'll never get into our Daniel study. Okay, so we are actually in chapter four. I want to talk about diplomacy. And we're going to read verses one through eight. And then we'll discuss a little bit. Now, I'm going to be splitting this up into a part one and a part two uh, so we can keep these short and sweet. And it says in uh, Daniel chapter four, verse one, King Nebuchadnezzar sent his message to the people of every race and nation and language throughout the world. Peace and prosperity to you. I want you all to know about the miraculous signs and wonders the Most High God has performed for me. How great are his signs, how powerful his wonders. His kingdom will last forever and his rule through all generations. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was living in my palace in comfort and prosperity, but one night I had a dream that frightened me. I saw visions that terrified me as I lay in my bed. So I issued an order calling in all the wise men of Babylon so they could tell me what my dream meant. When all the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and fortune tellers came in, I told them the dream, but they could not tell me what it meant. At last, Daniel came in before me. I told him the dream. He was named Belteshazzar after my God, and the spirit of the holy gods is in him. Now, you know, he's already had several encounters with God, and he just keeps doing mixture. There's mixture that's going on here in his belief system because he's a pagan, and they believed in having several gods. I mean, adding another god to their, um, you know, plethora of gods was probably not that big of a deal. Uh, so his theology is that he's sharing a testimony of the most high God, and yet he is saying that Daniel has the spirit of the holy gods in him. So we can definitely see some confusion here. Now, in other translations, it actually says he has the spirit of the holy God. Uh, that word that is translated there can be gods and uh, plural. So um, that's, you know, can be a little bit tricky. So he might have recognized the one true God in Daniel, or he may have just recognized that the gods were in him from his pagan theology. Uh, but the, the word he used was Elah. And um, we do know that if he was a true convert, a true believer, he would have dismantled the um, magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and fortune tellers, and he would have gone strictly with Daniel and the one true God. So obviously we have a person who um, is encountering God, but it's not present, it's not producing change in his theology, change in his life and how he does business. Now in verse eight, um, let's see, no, I'm sorry. Uh, let's go to verse nine. I said to him, Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you and that no mystery is too great for you to solve. Now tell me what my dream means. While I was lying in my bed, this is what I dreamed. I saw a large tree in the middle of the earth. The tree grew very tall and strong, reaching high into the heavens for all the world to see. It had fresh green leaves, and it was loaded with fruit for all to eat. Wild animals lived in its shade, and birds nested in its branches. All the world was fed from this tree. Okay, so notice here that Daniel is referred to... Um, where did it go? Uh, oh, I lost it. The chief of magicians. Where did that go? Yeah, in verse nine, I said to him, Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians. Now the word uh, magicians is hartum, and it's used for magician only in Daniel. And it refers to people who quote, practice sorcery, and other occult practices were advisors and counselors of the king. Now, I just, you know, if you think your job's bad as a Christian, let's just let this sink in for a second. 
Daniel was the chief magician. So he was over all the other ones. And a magician is one who practiced sorcery and other cult practices. So here we have a Jewish man who was taken captive as a young teenage boy. He is put into the king's service because of his wisdom, because of uh, he was of an excel excellent spirit. Because of his gifting in interpretation of dreams, which is a form of wisdom, he is then placed to be in charge of all of the occultists. So it's astonishing. It's something to note. I would say that if you um, have been put in a position of employment that maybe it's not your favorite, maybe just think about Daniel. Because Daniel did not compromise. He did not practice the uh, occultic practices at all. And he loved God. I mean, the man wouldn't eat food, food that was unclean. So he obviously, I'm sure, was grieved in his spirit by what he saw. Um, but that was the position that he was in. And God actually put him in that position to influence the king. See, here's the thing. Christians like to stay really far away from unpleasantness. They like to stay really far away from darkness because it's shocking. Um, but it reminds me of a story I heard, and I didn't know what teacher was teaching this. He's, uh, but it was like an allegory. He said that you have a man that, uh, was walking down the street at night and he saw a man underneath a pole with the light on looking for something. And so he approached the man and said, may I help you? It looks like you're looking for something. He said, yes, I've lost my keys. And so they start looking and the man's like, well, I cannot find your keys. I've looked everywhere with you. And he said, well, yes, I lost them in the dark, but I can't see there. So the, the, the purpose of that is a lot of times we're looking for the opportunity to impact and influence nations and cities and people groups, but we're not willing to be light in the darkness. We're not willing to get in the sewer and fish people out. And so when you're a marketplace minister, you're going to be exposed to things and it shouldn't shock you and it shouldn't cause you to doubt that God has put you in that position for a purpose. In fact, the um, reason that Daniel was put in that position is because God entrusted him. He, he trusted that Daniel would serve him and not be swayed by the magicians. And uh, so the fact that you may be in a position where you are exposed to a lot is not to be viewed as um, uh, a burden. It should be viewed as a compliment from God that he thinks that you can handle the heat and that you can be a light. You can continue to be a light in darkness in that place. Okay, so one of the reasons that, you know, I feel Christians have so ostracized themselves from society is the uh, monastery ideas that started way back in the day where Christians just felt like the world was so filthy and so unholy and so corrupt that they had to withdraw completely from society, even against the admonition of Paul in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Uh, and they began to go to monasteries and uh, convents. And there's like this idea that you, ha like you have to be really careful because if you're around some people, they may influence you to do evil. Well, actually, you're influenced to do evil from your own heart, according to James. So if that is there, that's on you. It's not on anybody else. And we're so afraid of being wrongly influenced that we have withdrawn from uh, society. We are not having any influence or impact like we should. And um, and so one of the, the truths that I think that we need to recapture that Daniel walked in is that the spirit of God is greater than any influence outside of him. And so if we live in a continuous awareness of his presence, and we live in a continuous awareness of purpose as marketplace ministers and what that looks like, then the influence of others will not impact us. And uh, in 1 Corinthians 5, this is what I was referring to that Paul um, talked about. 
in uh, verses 9 through 12, it said, When I wrote to you before, I told you not to associate with people who indulge in sexual sin, but I wasn't talking about unbelievers who indulge in sexual sin or are greedy or cheat people or worship idols. You would have to leave the world to avoid people like that. I meant that you are not to associate with anyone who claims to be a believer, yet indulges in sexual sin, is greedy, worships idols, is abusive, a drunkard, cheats people, don't even eat with such people. It isn't my responsibility to judge outsiders, but it is certainly your responsibility to judge those inside the church who are sinning. So again, like if we go over to James, and this is not in my notes, so bear with me for a second. So if we go over to James chapter 1, um, he talks about how temptation works. And let's see here if I can find it. Uh, let's see. God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. Afterward, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. And remember... When you are being tempted, do not say, God is tempting me. God is never tempted to do wrong, and he never tempts anyone else. Temptation comes from your own desires, which entice and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions, and when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. So we can't even blame others for being tempted. If we're tempted, that's our heart condition and our responsibility to deal with not anybody else's. Uh, now, um, also, you know, emotional intelligence work is very important because while most people equate sin with like sexual sin and greed and things like that, which Paul obviously does, there's other things like, you know, avoiding gossip, not being involved in drama, um, not being an angry and offended person because of workplace issues, um, not being impatient. So those are things that need to be included and emotional intelligence work, understanding your personality and how it can respond to such things is very important and it's crucial. In fact, according to research, emotional intelligence is the number one predictor of success in all areas of life. Most of the coaching I do is a lack of emotional intelligence or there is a misunderstanding of personalities between couples or there's a lack of emotional intelligence in both or at least one. Um, and so... We have to allow our spiritual and our emotional intelligence to um, be guarded, to be developed uh, as marketplace ministers. Uh, you know, the spirit man inside of us was made perfect the minute we were born again. The soul was trained in the ways of the world, and it has to be retrained. And that's where a lot of times the area of being tempted can actually gain a hook in those those parts of our soul that are not um, transformed. So here's the deal. Sin always comes from unbelief. Always. Unbelief always comes from believing a lie. So if you look at Adam and Eve, the first thing you need to ask yourselves is why are they even near the tree that God said to not eat from? And so the fact that they are standing at that tree tells me the desire was already there for that tree. So before the enemy even showed up to tempt Adam and Eve, they already wanted to eat from that tree, and that's evident by the fact they were standing there. Then the enemy approached the female who did not have the direct communication from God. It, was, uh, it came from Adam. She was the weakest link because of that. He lied. She believed it. Adam was standing right there. He believed it. They both ate. Rebellion was birthed into the earth. So... Um, anything that you fear, any fear of loss, any fear of, you know, really loss, that's, that's the main one, will cause you, um, to get into your ego and it will cause you to make decisions that make you susceptible, uh, to temptation. So it's always a heart condition. It's something that we need to guard because out of that flow the issues of life. So I always tell people that, you know, when you're in a work environment, so again, Daniel is the chief magician. That word means he's over the occultists, those who practice sorcery. So in order to maintain a separation from that sin, he recognized the spirit of God as more powerful, but he also practiced skillful emotional and spiritual intelligence. 
you know, his praying three times a day was a necessity for him. That was a practice. That was a habit he developed that kept him in touch and in tune with God. Uh, David broke out into spontaneous praise seven uh, times a day. And, you know, there's seven words for praise. What would happen if a believer, uh, you know, seven times a day, like would eat snacks, would take one of those praise words and just take a moment to do that? Um, and, and that's where a lot of his songs came from. And so that was a practice that he did. Um, and I could break down the whole Bathsheba thing, but we don't have time, but I can tell you it was a lack of emotional intelligence. Um, and it made him susceptible. So when it comes to living in a state of awareness, you have to recognize when you're believing lies. And typically fear is involved, unbelief is involved, wrong decision making is involved. And so you want to dive into also, you know, one thing that a lot of people don't understand is reacting versus responding can also be a sign of fear of loss uh, because people will just immediately re react and you're like, hold up now, hold up. <laughs> we don't need to, you know, react. We need to pause and figure out, number one, why are you reacting? But number two, what's going on here? And sometimes you're just tired or, you know, sometimes you're, you, you just been, you know, had a busy day or whatever. I mean, I'm not saying that if you snap at someone or if you've been impatient that you need to go and do some soul work. But if there's a pattern of it, um, I would definitely do that. Um, so harmful actions, thinking the same negative thoughts, sabotaging the goodness of God in your life. Those are typically signs that you need to pause and you need to deal with the root system that is based in uh, lies. And so um, Holy Spirit, as you're in the word, he'll begin to highlight those things to you. This is a continuous process. You know, I've had my business uh, officially launched in 2017, Genius Communication, which is now Genius Al. And before Christians freak out that I named it Genius Al, the reason I named it Genius Al is Al, rep, Al's represent wisdom. So Genius Wisdom. But um, when you when I look back at just the personal growth that I've had to have in my profession and how it is intrinsically tied to my call, it's been incredible. Um, I started my first business in 1998, same thing. Marriage, same thing. Raising children, same thing. Every marketplace minister needs to understand that your profession is the battleground and it's also the place of your greatest growth. So as you're confronted with things, as you go about your work, you don't need to be surprised and just take it as an opportunity to go deeper in your soul work, go deeper in processing things, and I'm not talking about navel gazing. You can literally do this in seconds or minutes, but some things do take a little bit more time because they're so embedded in your thinking. So having this business and having Holy Spirit impact you and show you things is one of the most adventurous, but also it can be um, quite challenging. So, but anyway, God wants to use your professional life um, to grow you. And then uh, in James 1 21, I don't want to miss this one. It says, um, so get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives and humbly accept the word God, the word God has planted in your hearts for it has the power to save your souls. Now that's interesting because our souls are already saved because we're born again. So what is James talking about? Well, he's ta he's not talking about going to hell. He is talking that a soul is saved or transformed, delivered from rotten and stinking thinking through the word. And so as you go into the word, which the word saved there is sozo. So it's the exact word that's used for salvation or being born again. But it literally means to make whole. So there's other generalized ideas around it as well. But God wants to make your soul whole. And often the avenue he will do that is the marketplace. 100%, 100%, guys. I have been in business for a very long time. And I can tell you, outside of marriage and raising my son, my business or my employment has caused more growth than anything else in my life, okay? So we take the word, we allow it to highlight things, we allow it to expose things, we cooperate with the process, and he makes our souls whole and powerful so that no amount of ne negative influence from others can sway us. Now this is key and this is crucial as a marketplace minister. 
So I, I want to I want to stop there because we'll get back to Nebuchadnezzar's dream and the diplomacy that was needed. Uh, but I will tell you that the way that Daniel responded to Nebuchadnezzar shows the soul work that he had done. It shows his belief system because it was a word of judgment. And if he had any wounding in his soul from his experiences, he'd be like about time. You know what? You are a sorry pagan and you're going to eat grass for seven years because you suck as a human. You know, like he could have just let them have it. But Daniel had diplomacy, he had excellence, he had integrity, and he also had a love for this king. And so it's very, very important. And I know it gets hard. You, you guys know me, I'm fiery. I am fiery when it comes to politics. I don't have any uh, time or room for nonsense, which by the way, the Republicans, they're wise up. And uh, but I don't want to get started on that. You know what I'm saying? We'll, we'll discuss that on urgent education tomorrow. But be happy that your marketplace work is also the place where God will do soul work. Isn't that neat? So we don't have to run from it. We don't have to hide from it. We don't have to be frustrated by the people around us acting like pagans because that's what they are. That's what sinners do. They sin. We don't have to, you know, one day hope that we can go off and live in a mountain and cabin and not have to interact with people. Um, again, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 9. That's nonsense. We're not monks or uh, nuns. And, and, and we need to embrace that God, his main battleground is a marketplace and each of us have a role in that. So I am going to go run a quick errand before I have my prayer time. Uh, I will see you guys tomorrow uh, for urgent education. We'll break down some of the elections, some of the thoughts I have, the direction of the country. And I might go ahead and do a little bit of some training um, on the Constitution and founding documents. I don't know. It just depends on how um, deep I go into the election. So anyway, have a great night and I will see you guys tomorrow.